So we're calling it Future Proofing Generation Pi. A lot of words in there, I'll explain all of them. Um, I'm Hani, I'm the Dean of uh, Dubai Institute of Design and Innovation. I studied uh, architecture at MIT, and then I realized I didn't know anything, so I went and continued did my master's in architecture from Harvard, and still I felt that design education needs to improve, so I came back to the Middle East, and two years ago we launched the school, which is an exciting opportunity. I think that design matters more today than before. There's a huge demand for design. Look at this stage, look at the people we have here, because everything human is designed, not, not everything human is well designed, and if you saw the speeches before with Tare and all the other speakers, we see that design can actually change the world. And I want to argue that design is at the core of the fourth industrial revolution. Who's heard of the fourth industrial revolution? But the first industrial re revolution is the invention of the steam engine. And this is how they teach it in school. We went from steam to electricity, then we went to IT systems, and then the cloud but no one's actually thinking about what does it do to users. Who does that? Designers think about users. So users started um, receiving commodities with mass production, then started demanding um, services, and then started demanding experiences, and today we are looking for something new, but what we're looking for is a sense of fulfillment. Who is of the generation that your parents roll your eyes and tell you, gosh, you are so entitled, right? Do you get that? Do you get that? That they tell you, oh, you're so entitled. Right? No. Basically, what's happening is that technology is making you want to receive customized information about yourself. So if you wear a Fitbit, it's telling you details about you. It's not telling you the stock market, it's not telling you the weather, it's telling you details about your vital inner workings. So that's why you feel you're entitled, because technology has taken us to a place where at the core of everything that we do is you. So that's why, so next time your parents come and tell you you're so entitled, tell them this is where we're going. So we're seeking fulfilling experiences, which is looking after the individual's needs at a very fundamental level. And this fulfillment, like the Fitbit I just mentioned, explains how we can take design and place it at the core of the Industrial Revolution. Because if you look at the capital stage, what they talk about, they're talking about how to be profitable, how to make money. People who go study business are learning about money and making money. So that's what they learn. And in engineering school, they're teaching them how to make things work. That's what they care about. But the designers, what we care about is someone on the other side saying, it actually touches me. Right? So we place the user first. It's our nature to do that. You know, how many of you have said, you know, just tell me it's fantastic. Don't pay me, but just tell me it's fantastic, right? Designers, we do this because we care about how people feel about the change we're making, right? And I think today we are changing the conversation happening on the capital stage and the tech stage where we're actually, business people are trying to find ways how to make it productive, the user, and how to make the user efficient. So it's not about the product, it's about the experience. And where do they go to get that knowledge? To designers. So designers are taking a central role where we're actually, if I compare these two cars together, th your decision is not going to be made on this, the engineering, it's going to be based on the experience, on the emotion, on how it makes you feel, how it makes you be perceived the same thing with a phone. The last time you did this, you lost the warranty, right? So you don't look at that. You're looking at the phone as an object that represents you, your emotional status. So there's another challenge for designers today. And you all 
face it, I'm sure, in your work, which is basically when you're designing a phone today, form does not follow function anymore. It's ridiculous. If I give this to an alien, the phone on your right, they will, within a few minutes, figure out how to use it. And it has one function, which is to phone someone. But if you give them the device on your left, it's just a black box. So form does not follow function. We've gone beyond that. And also, form, form is now intimate. It's more intimate because you put the products on your skin, on your body. It's an intimate relationship you have with them. And designers have the uncanny ability to empathize with that. So design is actually going to change the way we use technology. And design, we argue, is actually the bridge between strategy on one side and technology on the other side. So we need, as designers, to know about technology, to understand it at a deep level, and we need to understand strategy at a deep level. We can no longer relegate it to somebody else. We have to work with them. We have to empathize how to work with them. And I think that the tech stage and the capital stage and the design stage should be one stage and not separate geographies on this space. We need to merge them together in order to move forward. So if you're not sure and I want to talk to business people, I use this chart. This is the standard and poor's uh, uh, showing the growth of an investment of $10,000 over 10 years. But if you invest it in a design-led business, you're going to make much more money. I don't like numbers, but the numbers are on the screen. This is a very good source for you as designers to show the power of design to business people. Because design humanizes technology. It makes technology meaningful. It actually makes innovation visible. So all this prototyping, all this model making, all of this that you're doing, it's a skill that is so valuable today because you can make innovation visible to others. And not everyone can do that. And then the last thing is that design makes digital experiences desirable. Okay? So I'll talk about the drone in a minute. But then the question is, with all these changes happening, how do you change design education to actually bring those young people and you people to graduate and be able to make a difference in the world. And one way to do it is hybrid skills, which is basically um, the future, we think, when blockchains and robots will be the norm. What we need to do is future-proof our students. And this is a statistic from Dell. You've heard so many. This is the one I picked because 85% of the jobs of the future don't exist. And today, in, and in this amazing event, we are learning about all these possible jobs. So um, Omar before me talked about the engineer, the doctor, and the lawyer, and failure. Today, failure is the way forward. I do agree with that. That was a very, very pertinent statement. And today, some of the jobs that we could identify as an augmented reality designer. Who of you knows how to do augmented reality as a designer? Right? Who thinks it's going to be important in the future? Immediately. It's happening now. It's not the future anymore. And then you have a chief drone experience designer. This is one of my favorite because I can explain it to lay people. So when I... You, who's heard of this amazing technology that the drone can deliver your Amazon package to you, right? You've heard about that. But have you ever thought about it from a human perspective? Have you ever thought of the idea that there's a drone chasing you, right? And it's about to drop a box on your head and you don't know what's in it and why would you trust it? And what if it has, you know, a box of something fragile? So no one's thinking about the human experience of that. Yeah, technology can do it. Yeah, it might be a cool business because they save on couriers. But from a human experience, it's a, it's a horror movie, right? And it's not someone thinking about it. Yeah, you're laughing, but it's true. So this is what designers can do. Embodied technology design, all these devices in your body, the human organ designer, life or death situations that require designers. And I am proud to say that 
In Dubai, we are working directly with a medical university where we have an MOU developing programs because the medical school in Dubai wants design thinking to be a core in their curriculum, right? Medical school wants it to be core in their curriculum. So it's, it's really amazing time to be a designer. So Internet of Things conductor, um, chief design officer, and what we want to do is to make sure that our kids, our students, when they graduate, they are not redundant. And we want to make sure that to do that, we need to teach them in a combinatory way. Let me explain this idea, this hybrid skill that I'm talking about. So if I throw at you all these uh, trends in technology like blockchain and seamless conversation, UI overhauls, automation, all these things I throw at you like additive fabrication, embedded devices, we draw a blank. I draw a blank. Can you innovate with any of these on their own as they are? It's overwhelming. It's scary. It's intimidating. Right? But here's a way. Here's a key to solve it. Combine them. Combine two trends together. So additive fabrication and smart spaces, you can create a smart office. Immediately, you can think about it, right? Im try this one. Artificial intelligence and embedded devices. Can you imagine apps and services and startups with these two in mind? It's easier now when you combine them. So through combining things, innovation is possible. So don't think in a silo, think horizontally etc. So these are all different examples. Autonomous driving, augmented reality. Easy to understand. Immediately you can think within seconds of three or four possibilities. You see that? It's really simple. When you start combining things, it happens. So at DD, DIDI, Dubai Institute of Design Innovation, it's design and innovation. It's not just design. And we developed a program with two great schools of design, which is MIT in Boston and Parsons in New York. And what we, our DNA is basically combining design, which is visual literacy, which we study in design schools today, with digital fluency, which is the tech part, and then with the strategic proficiency, which is the strategic thing. So we combine all these three together, and we create the four C's, which are the drivers of every course in our curriculum. We offer four disciplines, product design, multimedia, fashion, and strategy, I'll tell you later why we picked those, but there's a very rational reason to pick those. But then you can argue with me and say, wait a minute, honey, you just said you want to combine things. So what are you combining? You're not combining anything. And that's true. And if I look at the jobs of the future we just looked at, they actually don't belong to any of these disciplines. So for example, if we look at interactive clothing or chief design officer or a drone conductor, they don't fit in those categories. So what do we do? The way we solved it is basically to combine education. So by the second year, our students combine two disciplines together. So they can do product and strategy, product and fashion, fashion and strategy, multimedia and strategy, etc. And what happens when you do that, you're actually including all these possible jobs of the future. So if you want to do interactive clothing, you study multimedia and fashion. If you want to be chief design officer, you study strategy and product design together. You get the idea. So combination opens up infinite possibilities. And we, we just launched this program this year. So we're very excited to see what the students will do. Design thinking. Everyone's talking about design thinking. We've all been doing design thinking all our lives, so we didn't think that there was a name for it, right? It's just the way we are. But what we discovered while teaching it is something incredible. So you know the steps of it. I won't bore you. You're creative. You understand it. But I'll go over them quickly in a different slide, which is basically when we teach our students to empathize, we're teaching them tolerance. And when we're teaching them to identify problems, we're actually teaching them critical thinking. And when we teach them how to ideate, we're teaching them the skill of collaboration, which is an art. It requires trust. It requires building relationships. It's building on each other's ideas. And when we teach them how to prototype, we're teaching them how to communicate and visualize. And then when we teach them how to test, 
we are teaching them how to listen and iterate how to respond to failure, which Omar did a fantastic job explaining just before me on this stage. So we, you, it's important to persevere. And what we discovered is that what we're teaching when we're te teaching design thinking is teaching them the life skills that they need to succeed. And in fact, these are the same three skills that the World Economic Forum has identified as the key to the fourth industrial revolution. It comes back. So it's perfect. So we are on track now developing soft skills and hard skills for our students in a way to do it. So when people tell us to advance and they tell us all the time or they tell us to use technology and they tell us all the time to do it and when they tell us to innovate, 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 to me it doesn't make sense because it's lacking design thinking. It's too vague. It's too banal. It's too intimidating. It's just overused. And so what I created here is what design thinking does to all these three things that we're being asked to do. Design thinking makes it a meaningful advancement. It actually makes it humanized. It actually takes it to a level where it's desirable. And this is fulfillment. This is the goal of the fourth industrial revolution. And this is what we want to do. So in the remaining time I have, which is about just five minutes, if you can hang on with me, I'm going to show you what our first year students did and some work from this semester. We, we haven't even uh, finished the first semester, we're about to finish it. So as you know, it's Parsons at MIT. One of the most simple things is that um, a company in Dubai loved the first year drawings from the first week, and so they made them into coffee cups. Um, this is great, we're happy, we get the celebrity uh, status in Dubai, but this is a uh, work of first year students who worked with Vitra on a design challenge for chairs. This is a four week project from the beginning of the semester. And these are all the different collaborations that we've done. This is with the medical school. Um, this is with Expo 2020. We're designing costumes for the opera, upcoming co opera with the students. We are doing work with Bene, an Austrian furniture company. We, we're, we represented student work at Jitex, which is the largest tech event in the uh, Emirates. Uh, we went to Nukat. Uh, we worked with Dubai courts where they wanted to integrate design thinking into the legal system. Um, we actually presented at Saudi Design Week. Um, you get the idea. And this is work from this year's first year students for a project with Herman Miller. This is another five week project. Um, they were supposed to select one uh, student. They se ended up selecting five. We're developing an innovation lab, just showing you some of the things we're doing. I'll just go fast with these. So in this um, thing, what's amazing about Dubai is that it's so diverse. We have 86 students and 24 nationalities, and we have six nationalities for the faculty as well. Here you can see uh, most of us. I will uh, skip over it, but just fascinating people that we have. We have an amazing facility for fabrication where the students spend a lot of time and from day one, they learn to code and they learn how to build electronics. Um, this is Amal working on one of her first projects. Um, first year student and our faculty get published all the time with inventions and ideas. Um, basically, the other thing, we engage high schools. We engaged around 5,000 high school students um, in, in the Emirates. Uh, where we developed a program for designing habitats on Mars. Um, we actually developed, um, this is the students presenting, we, we taught them coding for augmented reality. Um, and then this is a typical example of a first year program where they learn to make forms, starting with their hands and then making it in 3D, and then going back into digital and manual and producing the, the, the products through new materials and then changing that into a gaming environment and which they develop a game and then you can see these gaming environments so they are coding with Unity, they are designing and using all types of tools and then we have a, a day where they display their games to the public. This is in our lobby and you can see immediately they're learning Rhino and Grasshopper from 
year one. This is year one. It's not like year five or four. It's from the first week that they learn to do it. They learn CNC. They learn how to make surfaces. And they also learn, because we have a very strong program in sustainability, they learn how to make their own bioplastics. So these are the students, and they create recipes and an exhibition. So some more of the work that we do. And basically, robotics is something very important. So in the first year, they had to do a robotic farm, um, a robotic zoo. I'm sorry, these are all different projects. And these are workshop projects. These are not the studio conceptual projects. And here's a robotic zoo event taking place in our lobby. In the studio, we spend more time on them developing their own concept. This is the work of Shamma, where she created these shoes that if you sh shoe slippers, if you step inside them, you feel different textures. So one is grass and one is sand. So you can wear it all day and feel you are walking on grass. This is the work of Sana. She's a doctor, actually went back to design school. This is to confuse the senses. So the project they had to do was basically to enhance or suppress a human sense. This is to actually give your feet more sensation as you walk. This is to actually twist your neck. Uh, Abdurrahman is from Egypt. We're very proud. We have three students from Egypt. Give them a hand. Yes. We want more of you to come and join us. This is a view 360. This is from Ahsan and Annabella actually experiencing uh, vitals. And this is from Maha. She's also from Egypt. And Philippe from Lebanon. And they created a, a way to feel the weight of the sand in the desert. So you get the idea. This is Abdul Aziz designing a product for the blind and basically the studio culture that we have together. So they created an interactive um, virtual reality experience. It's mind boggling. These are first year students, guys. These are first year students. It's just mind boggling. And they actually designed a chair that responds to the program inside, so the chair pokes you, kicks you off, does all sorts of things, and it works. This is the culture that we have of the studio. And this is a fantastic story of a collapsible tower that was meant to be deployed in harsh climates, like in, on Mars or on Earth in the desert. And it basically, uh, with a flick of a hand, anyone can do it. It rises to become a three-meter uh, tower habitation that you can collapse and travel with and quickly have. Look at the drawings of these kids. Yeah, it's just mind boggling. We're very lucky. This is the failure of that project. They failed so many times and we encourage failure in the school. We encourage it and we push for it and they failed so many times until they actually got the solution that they were looking for. Some more images. This is a work of a genius student we have. This is an actual robot that moves, picks up plastic, and recycles it into filament, and it 3D prints it, and it works. And all the components were designed and built by Nikolish. He designed them, he built them, the gears, everything was 3D printed by this 19-year-old um, kid, right? And so they, they all keep a blog of their work. You can see this is a salt, uh, using salt because there's excess salt in the Emirates to actually build structures. So it's a robotic arm that sprays a saline solution that then becomes a structure, a physical structure, and they actually made it work. You can see here um, Safa holding the samples that they did. This, we're very proud of this project. This was actually a skin of a building, and all the components were made by the students. Um, this actually responds to heat, and it opens and closes. And this is a first-year project that I'm proud to say made it to the Global Gracho, right? So first-year student in the Global Gracho. It was just mind-boggling, and we were very proud of that. So I'm, I'm done, but I just want to close with this. We call the group of students we have superheroes on WhatsApp. They are superheroes, they are pioneers, they're trusting us, and they're coming to a new school in Dubai, and they're doing wonders. So basically, the, the design that we did in the first year, this we call the ABC, you can see 
all these different things that we did alphabetically, we put them together. This is what DIDI is. It's not just design, it's design and innovation. We're preparing generation pi because they're deep in two fields, like the Greek letter pi, not just one leg, where they are actually deep in two skills and they're actually able to work across different boundaries in this combinational approach. They're deep because they have two fields of study and basically they are being prepared to actually solve the problems, the wicked problems of our world. That's why we call them superheroes. Here they are, by firmly planting both their feet in the ground and actually preparing to find